Once again, another iceberg chart on this channel. This is going to be the black metal lore iceberg chart. I've already done three previous iceberg charts to this one, so I'm not going to waste my time explaining how this template works. However, the one big difference between this chart and the previous three is that usually I talk about the music specifically when doing an iceberg chart, where within this one, Black Metal's lore, I'm going to be focusing specifically on the backstory, the controversy, the politics, the controversy, little known details, the controversy, quirky, funny little stories about Black Metal to its controversy, <laughs> and of course, the controversial stuff as well because one thing you're going to realize within this chart is that black metal just seems to be addicted to controversy so this chart is going to have six tiers and like always i like to break them within categories that way it makes it a bit easier to understand all the topics at hand that i'll be talking about so it's going to start off at tier number one that being black metal 101 the title of this tier basically says it all the moment you get into black metal, you're going to be finding out about these stories really quick. So I'm just going to get the really obvious one out of the way, that being the murder of Euronymous done by Varg, stabbed him 23 times in his home, and um, I really don't feel like talking any more about the details with this because it's been said and discussed so many times, even almost 30 years after the events of this, it's still talked about as if it happened yesterday. So, yeah, seriously, anyone who's into black metal, even from your first day getting into it, you more than likely have heard this story at least half a dozen times by now. I just want to say it's kind of crazy that I'm starting this iceberg chart off with a murder. But anyway, moving on next to the debate between Venom and Bathory, who is the first black metal band. And there's been numerous debates about this topic ever since you know black metal started is who was the first black metal band and i've heard both sides of the argument and how i look at it my two cents with it and don't let this dictate what you think of it is that i've looked at it that venom is the prototype to black metal where bath 3 is the more fleshed out version of what black metal was going to become so Yes, you could say Venom was the first, as they were the first to kind of approach with it as well, too. They coined the phrase with their sophomore full-length album, that being Black Metal. But Bathory is more of the, God, true Black Metal take. So that's my two cents with it. But again, I've heard numerous debates as Venom was the first. But regardless, this debate as to who was the first Black Metal band, Venom or Bathory has been going on for years. Dead suicide that happened back on April 8th of 1991 is very notorious. As Dead would commit suicide through shotgun and he was convinced by Euronymous, his bandmate, to do so. And the photo taken by Euronymous of Dead Suicide was used for a bootleg live album of a show they did back in 1990, that being Dawn of the Black Hearts. First wave black metal and second wave black metal have a few distinct differences. First wave black metal popped up around like the mid to late 80s and was more rooted in like thrash and traditional heavy metal. You know, again, stuff like Venom, Bathory, Sarcophago, even Merciful Fate to a certain degree. That it sounds like Motorhead, but just way more savage and faster and obviously more blackened and darker. Where second wave black metal popped up around like the early 90s and was all like the Scandinavian black metal bands, you know, again, obviously like Mayhem, Burzum, Dark Throne, Immortal, and Emperor, that gave off more of like that necro and raw take that is considered true black metal. The Fantas Stave church burning that happened back on June 6th of 1992 was strongly suspected that Varg committed the arson where he used the church burning as album artwork for his EP, Ashes. Quartz paint has become very synonymous within the aesthetic of black metal, where a black metal musician will use white and black makeup to make their appearance look as if they were inhumane, demonic, 
or have the appearance of a corpse. The album artwork for the debut full-length album by Celtic Frost to Megatherion was done by H.R. Giger, which I always thought was so cool that he's a fan of this band. The guy who did the design for the Xenomorph for the Alien franchise also did album artwork for Celtic Frost along with the first two Triptychon albums. I always thought this was just such a cool fun fact. And finally for Tier 1 will be the infamous Lords of Chaos book that basically everyone within black metal, from the musicians, fans, and critics alike, hate this book. From its inaccuracies and just overall storytelling that's just really inconsistent, it's been panned by so many people that it's highly regarded to avoid this book at all costs if you want to get into black metal. Moving on to tier number two, which I'm just going to call it Black Metal 102. This is stuff that, again, most people would know had you been into black metal for at least around a month or so, these stories are going to be popping up. The original drummer for Emperor, Faust, committed murder to a homosexual man, Magne Andresen, back on August 21st of 1992. Faust was sentenced to 14 years in prison, but served 9 years and 4 months. John Notvade, the guitarist and vocalist for Dissection, was convicted of being an accessory to murder back in 1997 and was released from prison in 2004. He then committed suicide by shotgun on August 13th of 2006. The reason for this was because he felt as if in the satanic bible that he really kept up with that a satanist dies strong with a smile on his face basically stating that he accomplished everything he wanted to in life and ended his life on his terms. Varg's YouTube channel, Tholian Perspective, was a YouTube channel done by Varg, the frontman for Burzum, where he did many different videos talking about the history of the Norwegian black metal scene, his uh, viewpoints on a lot of things, that having to do with history and society and political stuff, which is a huge reason as to why it got taken down a handful of years ago for a lot of, you guessed it, controversial hot takes by Varg. However, some of those videos are still available to be watched on YouTube as they were uploaded by different people who saved those files. In the music video for Candle Mass's Bewitched, at the end portion of this music video, you see a bunch of teenage metalheads stomping away. Well, one of those extras for that part just so happens to be dead from mayhem. Obtained enslavement's witchcraft is something really important that I want to bring up within this video. Because for a lot of people that criticize black metal, they look at it that it's very formulaic. That if you've heard one black metal band, you've heard it all. There's really not much that can be done within this genre. There's really no musical integrity attached with black metal because, again, of how formulaic it is. And obviously that's very wrong. And I feel like the one album that showcases how wrong of a take that is, is Obtained Enslavement's Witchcraft. Because the best way to describe this album is... It's black metal done by people who understand classical music. Like, they have a really strong understanding of how classical music theory goes. And it's all credited to the guitarist and keyboard player within the band at the time, Hex. So, from my personal standpoint, a reason why it's in this iceberg chart is this is the best example I can give to someone showcasing that black metal can be done with just very, very well done professional grade A musicianship. So Gorgoroth has a handful of stories I could be talking about. The most noticeable one is the legal battle they had within Poland. One of the shows they did back in 2004, they had the stage filled up with headless sheep, naked crucified bodies, and used 80 liters of sheep blood around the stage. Well, in Poland, that's considered a criminal offense of animal cruelty, and thankfully those charges were dropped as the band was unaware of them. The other being Gull. The vocalist at the time for Gorgoroth was sentenced to a year in prison because he tortured a 40-year-old man after a party. It's just like, <laughs> how many more crimes and controversy 
are we going to go through? This is only the second tier. The mastermind behind Windeer, Valfar, sadly passed away of hypothermia back on January 14th of 2004 when he attempted a hike through a snowstorm to get to his family's cabin. His body wasn't found until three days after the snowstorm had passed over. Death Like Silence is probably the most known black metal label to ever have existed, as it was owned by Euronymous and put out some of the black metal classics that we all know and love to this day, such as the debut full-length Burzum album, Mayhem's Death Crush, and of course, Mayhem's Demysteries Dom Satanus. Third wave black metal is really hard to discuss because a lot of people don't even consider it to be a thing. I think the reason for that is these are people that believe that after the second wave black metal scene happened, they consider that black metal just died out entirely. While others argue that third wave black metal happened immediately right after second wave, bands like Thorns, Mysticum, and Dodheimsgard that were being more experimental playing around with industrial music is considered third wave black metal. So it's more of like the experimental parts of black metal that is considered third wave. But at the same time, I've seen people argue that third wave black metal happened around like the late 2000s and early 2010s when Death Heaven and Wolves in the Throne Room and Panopticon was showing off. So third wave black metal, the term, seems to be really distinguished all differently to the point that I, I really can't tell you exactly what it is, but on rare occasions it's brought up. And closing off Tier 2 will be Lords of Chaos, the film, directed by Jonas Ackerland, who used to be the drummer for Bathory for a short period of time. But yes, this film was released in 2018, and what's really crazy is that although you can say everything about the book and attach it to the film, it doesn't get nearly as hated on as the book still. And I think that's because the film had low expectations to begin with. A lot of the black metal fans that were aware of this knew it was going to suck. And I think that's why they kind of laugh at it more in a more like satirical way, opposed to just like hating on it like as they do the book. Proceeding on to tier number three, which I just titled it simply Figures. The title of this tier is in reference to numbers, basically stuff that has to do with record sales and stuff of the sort. So what is listed as the highest selling black metal album is Dimmy Borgir's Death Cult Armageddon that sold over 130,000 copies within the United States alone. Now what sucks about this information and some of the rest of the information regarding record sales that I'll be talking about is that this isn't fully up to date because again I stated within North America that's not regarding all the European countries and their record sales so keep that in mind but what it's listed as is the highest selling black metal album is Demi Borgir's Death Cult Armageddon and furthering that information what is considered the highest selling black metal band overall is Emperor it was listed back in 2003 that they have sold over 500,000 copies within the discography. But again, it's really not that bulletproof of information if that's still regarded as they are the highest selling black metal band. As 500,000 copies was sold back in 2003, the updated number is nowhere to be found on the internet. And that was almost 20 years ago they were on those figures. And with all the represses and shows that they've done, I'm more than certain that that number more than likely has doubled since then. But yeah, as it stands, Demi Borgir's Death Cult Armageddon is the highest selling record and Emperor is the best selling black metal band. As for the highest selling album that was sold to an individual, well there's two candidates. On Discogs, it's listed that Bathory self-titled, but the Gold Go or Yellow Go edition of it sold for $3,000. And on eBay, Venom's Black Metal, which is supposedly like this super ultra rare pressing on semi-translucent red, 
that's been rumored that there's only two copies in existence of it was sold for a little over $3,700. The black metal band that has gone through the most members, both studio and live, is Abigail Williams, with a total of 54 different members that have gone in and out within this band. As for the longest running black metal album is Dodd's Angel Imperator. It runs for 150 minutes long. The black metal band that has the largest discography is Zorak Bal Thara. It has over 200 releases, 207 to be exact, from full lengths, EPs, demos, and splits. As I'm recording this video, there are over 43,000 different black metal bands listed within the metal archives, and if you alphabetize them by the English language, at the head helm on A would be this band called R, <laughs> which I find kind of funny, and at the end in Z would be Zafriqua. Hopefully I'm saying that somewhat right, but um, yeah, that's a bit of interesting information right there. And the last bit for tier number three is Batushka that owns the title with the band with the most clones. There are 27 different clones of Batushka, 28 in total, and the clones range from black metal, dubstep, gore noise, spoken word, Latin Americana music, like, uh, it got really out of hand and became a meme, basically, because a lot of those bands are satirical and meme takes on Batushka. But yeah, in total, if you want to get into Batushka, there's 28 in total different bands to check out. Now, on to tier four, that simply being Man of Culture. This tier is dedicated to all the diehards within Black Metal that just know all the nerdy little details that come with this genre of music that range from, of course, the controversial to all outright ridiculous and funny. And we'll start it off lighthearted with Sarcophago's debut full-length album. There's a song called Death Thrash that goes with one particular line that everyone knows. If you are a fault, don't enter. The nuclear drums will crush your brain. Because you'll be burned and died, slaughtering all with intensive pain. The frontman to the depressive suicidal black metal band, Nicholas Cavorth, is no stranger to controversy because when it comes to their live shows, Nicholas will basically mutilate himself in front of the audience. But one particular instance that's absolutely ridiculous was back in 2006, he disappeared from the music scene and a lot of people presumed that he committed suicide and that the new vocalist for Shining was going by the stage name Ghoul. And when they would do live shows, the individual would be basically cloaked from head to toe, but it was later revealed in 2007 that that was Nicholas, showcasing that he faked his death back then. Saul Evil is a black metal band from California that I included them in this iceberg chart because <laughs> their album artwork is just so funny and ridiculous how it's always this guy that's just got a ripped body showcasing it all the time <laughs> within the album artwork. White metal is a style of black metal that is basically the same in terms of song structure and characteristics. However, the big differences between the two is where black metal is all about anti-life, anti-Christian, just basically anti-religion. White metal is all the polar opposites of that, where it's pro-life, you know, life, pro-Christian, pro-religion, that really that's the only difference between the two. Earlier in this iceberg chart, I talked about that there's a big debate as to who is the first black metal band, Venom or Bathory. However, when it comes to the first United States black metal band, a lot of people seem to be in agreement that Vaughn was the first ever to do it, as they formed back in 1987. They were originally from Hawaii, but moved to California. 
And one other interesting fact about them is one of their demos has a song called Watain, and that's where the band Watain got their name from. The Keth Nexamu is a black metal band based out of Sweden, mainly composed by this individual that goes by the stage name Sawari the Puth. And the selling point about this band that makes them quite the standout is that all of their early material was improvised on the spot within the studio, which is really interesting if that's true, that this band sounds that good improvised. However, with their debut full-length album, it was delayed by a year because the other member, which was the drummer, tried strangling and murdering Sawai the Pooth, which he luckily got away. And again, it's the whole reason as to why the debut full and thumb was delayed by a year. The Pseudo God band pictures, in my personal view, are the gnarliest band photos within existence of black metal. Now, it's not uncommon for black metal musicians when they take band photos to have, like, maybe a human skeleton or, like, a skull or, you know, candles and pentagram stuff of the sort around them to really enhance the band photo. Well, Pseudogod took it the next step, and they went to a morgue to <laughs> get human body parts that were basically decomposing and pose with them within the band pictures, which again, I just find absolutely sickening, but at the same time, fucking gnarly. There's this one-man black metal project based out of South Korea called Faya that released his debut full-length album back in 2002 and started the project up in 2001. And what makes this quite the standout as to why it's in this iceberg chart is that the individual that started this project in 2001 was between the age of either 13 or 14, which meant when the debut full-length album came out, he was between the age of either 14 or 15, making him, from what I've seen, the youngest black metal musician that existed. And on the opposite ends is Root, a black metal band based out of Czechoslovakia that has considered one of the oldest black metal musicians, that being Big Boss, that started the project back up in 1987 and just recently discontinued the band earlier this year at the age of 70. So he might be one of the oldest. But another fun fact about Big Boss is that he actually started up the Satanic Church within Czechoslovakia. The vocalist and guitarist for the black metal band Nocturnal Depression suffers from a deficiency called ectrodactyly. It's a reason as to why he only has two fingers on his left hand, and even after suffering the symptoms of it, he still continues to play guitar to this day within the band. Bethlehem is a black metal band based out of Germany and one of my personal favorites within the German black metal scene. However, they faced <clears throat> controversy because during one of their shows they gave a copy of Digtus Tainakare to one of their fans at the time. It was a 14-year-old boy. That 14-year-old boy became so invested within the music that he started lashing out and becoming more aggressive towards his parents, even making kind of like a satanic altar within his room that the parents attacked back on Bethlehem, blaming them for the reason why their son has just such poor behavior that they were actually banned from playing within a few German cities around that time. Which is just ironic because Bethlehem's lyrical content has nothing to do with Satanism. Then there's Silencer with the uh, very infamous frontman, Natrum, which um, there's a lot of controversy around him to the point that it's just like unbelievable. For one, he used to be in an insane asylum for a bit in his life. He would mutilate himself. He cut off his hands and replaced it with pig hooves. Then there's the supposed incident where he tried killing a five-year-old girl with an axe, but he was apprehended by the police, to the point that he's not even a real person, it's all made up. But yeah, for a lot of the black metal fans that really dive headfirst into the lore of black metal, at some point you're going to come across the story of this man. Melikesh is a black metal band originally from Jerusalem, Israel. And you can already tell where the story is going, that they were actually kicked out of the country basically through threats and death threats from the religious people of Israel, that they had to relocate to the Netherlands, then to Germany. Which just showcases that everywhere apart in this world, 
there's always some religious fanatics that don't want anything to do with a band just simply playing music. And the last bit for Tier 4 will be Blasphemy, the reasons as to why they're blacklisted from playing within North America. Because if you've noticed by now, they only do like one-off shows within festivals and they're typically the headliner and they've done shows in Brazil, Germany, and now they're about to do one in Mexico. But it's never within North America where they're from, that being Canada. You don't see any shows for them within the States or Canada. And there's a few reasons as to why that is. They're all rumors, but they all kind of make sense. The big one that makes the most amount of sense, however, is during the early 90s when they were doing a few shows in California, well, their shows were just so intense for the audience that it would cause riots from the fans out in the streets, even trashing up the uh, venues that they were playing at, that after that, other vendors, if they were to play at their venue, they would want like a withdrawal of like a few thousand dollars from Blasphemy to cover up any damages that would soon come forth from the bands if they played at their venues. So that's one predicament that makes sense as to why they're blacklisted, but the others are just all rumors, so again, this isn't like factual evidence. One of them being that the vocalist has a felony against him because he was doing like grave robbering and like desecrating graves. That's one reason as to why that is. And others believe the fact that, again, this isn't factual evidence, that during a confrontation with a police officer, one of the members ended up punching the officer through a window with the confrontation, again, as to what led to his felony. So it seems at least that's consistent. The vocalist has a felony against him. Other than that, and the reasons for it are just unknown. All right, now we're at the second to last tier, that being tier number five, the politics. Yep, obviously if we're talking about politics and black metal within an iceberg chart, Gotta bring up, obviously, NSBM, National Socialist Black Metal, the big bad boy when talking about black metal, that started up in the early 90s, one of the first ever NSBM bands is Absurd, and basically the music is just carrying out the ideology, viewpoints, and politics of that being National Socialism. And on the opposite spectrum of things is RABM, which stands for Red Anarchist Black Metal. Typically the opposing viewpoints of NSBM, basically. Song structures are more rooted in crust punk, so they sound more like darker crust punk bands. But yeah, NSBM and RABM, two opposing different viewpoints within the realms of black metal. Well, if you think we're done talking about murders within this video, not yet, because next up is Hendrik Mobus, one of the members of Absurd. He went to jail back in 1993 for committing murder to Sandro Bayer, who was of Jewish descent, and wasn't released from prison until 2007. On the first presses of Transylvanian Hunger on the back cover, it says Norsk Arsk Black Metal, which translates to Norwegian Aryan Black Metal. But because of the controversy that the band would soon face, they changed it on the second pressing to True Norwegian Black Metal. Euronymous's political viewpoints is what he considered that he was a Stalinist, mainly because it made people suffer the most out of any viewpoint in history of mankind. Which, whether or not that is true, whether he's just doing it for clout to look edgier and more hateful, again, it's just funny that not many people bring this up that Euronymous was considered to be a Stalinist. There's this industrial black metal band called NKVD, which obviously they take their band name from the secret police force that for the Soviet Union back then, but their debut full-length album has lyrical themes to do with the Nazbul, the National Bolshevik, which I just never thought ever I would find any musical project, regardless of genre, having themes to do with the Nazbul at any point within my life. The Marduk vs. Antifa incident that happened back in 2016 was quite ridiculous. As you're going to realize, Antifa really doesn't like a lot of black metal bands. 
But the accusations opposed against Marduk as to why they were considered controversial as a Nazi band is they have lyrical themes to do with World War II, even though it's in basically that of a narration. And one of the members used to let Varg crash at his place like 20 years ago, or the fact that they used to do touring with Incantation, which at the time Craig Pillard was a part of that band and he's a really controversial figure, basically scraping the bottom of the barrel to find anything against Marduk for them not playing within the States. Then soon after that was Antifa versus Horna. The whole reason as to why they were so against Horna playing in the United States is I believe one of the members is in Pest Noir and he's a member for both Pest Noir and Horna. And because of just that alone, they were trying to just discontinue Horna from touring within the States. Well, they succeeded in some parts by threatening vendors from playing at their venues. However, what it led to was Horna playing in someone's backyard with double the audience, basically making double the profit from it. The last bit for this tier will be Graveland versus Antifa. Now, Rob Darkin, the mastermind behind Graveland, has some very controversial takes, you know, citing on nationalism and stuff of the sort, with his political viewpoints that makes him quite controversial, to say the least. However, when he was planning on doing a headline show for the Mesta Mortz Festival a handful of years ago, Antifa stopped him dead in his tracks by basically threatening the vendors for the Mesta Mortz Festival that if Graveland were to play, violence would ensue within the streets and towards the venue from Antifa, thus canceling the show for Graveland's appearance for the Mesta Mortz Fest. And we have finally made it to the last tier, tier number six, which I call Ultra True Black Metal. This tier is just all the ridiculous stuff that you really have to spend a lot of time on the internet to just come across or you've been keeping up with black metal every day trying to find every story, every little bit of information you can find and these are just so ungodly ridiculous. For starters, the guitarist for Marduk owns Fractures of the Skull of Dead from Mayhem. And what's just so ridiculous is the information about this seems so believable. I didn't even look into it for the most part. I just know that that has to be true because for everything regarding black metal, that just sounds just like so possible that it has to be true within the scene. Then there's Andres Bettinger, who goes by the stage name BSOD. He's mainly known behind his project, Grausenkite. And this individual is nothing short of just fucking insane. On his police records, he has 147 offenses. One of them has to do with indictment of hatred, another has to do with violence, and the other 145 offenses are drug related because he's an advocate user of heroin. <laughs> this man is so fucking insane. Then there are black metal bands that are a part of, or at least associate, with the Order of the Nine Angles, which is just basically a neo-Nazi occultist terrorist group that only has around like 300 to 350 members within this little like cult, basically. But it's really weird to know that some bands that play in the style of black metal also are a part of such a group. Oh, I really gotta talk about this, but uh, next up is Black Metal Veins. It's a documentary film directed by Lucifer Valentine. And if you know that individual, you know that this man is very infamous when it comes to filmmaking. Like, if you look at his filmography, it's very disturbing, to say the least. But yep, a film done by Lucifer Valentine, and uh, it keeps up with six individuals who are just regular heroin users that also are a part of a black metal band. Although the black metal band is never named within the film because I ended up watching it two nights ago just to get familiar with it before I talk about it here on YouTube. And um, yeah, not much to do with black metal other than like the influences or what attracted them to the music. But uh, the rest of the movie all has to do with just watching individuals 
being high on heroin, using heroin, and having sex while being on heroin, and ODing on it. It's just, um, uh, it's a really disturbing movie, and I'll just leave it at that. Pain Olympics is something on the internet where an individual basically mutilates and destroys their genitals on camera for the viewer's pleasure, if you want to say that. And there's one video online that you can find somewhere that is part of the Pain Olympics where a man, again, destroys his genitals, but the standout feature about it is, um, the background music is that of Burzum's philosophone. <laughs> it's, it's just so weird, and, uh, yeah, that combination of a description exists. The Black Metal Project Fadadis, with his single and music video attached with it, is probably one of the most ridiculous, low-budget things ever to exist, not just for Black Moon, but just music itself, that it's just so painfully bad that it's kind of like he became like the Tommy Wiseau of black metal itself with this one music video, that if you haven't seen it and you want just a really good laugh and chuckle, definitely check it out. Mutilation's sophomore full-length album remains of a ruined, dead, cursed soul has a first press where 40 to 60 copies were smeared with human blood on the vinyl jacket of them. Which I feel like it leads to the inspiration for the next individual, that being Maxime Ducardi, which I plan on doing a video all about him soon on this channel. But Maxime Ducardi is widely known by some people as the guy who does portraits with human blood, that being his own blood. And the quality of these portraits come out stellar, like they're really well done, that you can actually get a custom-made painting of human blood, whatever you want, by Max Dicardi through his Instagram, so definitely hit him up if that's something that intrigues you. But yeah, he also has a few other black metal projects, one of them being KFR, where he has kind of like these homemade music videos for the project that are really disturbing, I might add, that gives off like that low budget, lo-fi approach that's, again, just really creepy. That, yeah, if you enjoy dark, ambient, raw black metal, again, in vain of like the Les Legions Noir, definitely check out Maxime Ducardi's work. And the last bit for this tier, thus closing out this iceberg chart, is that Amoebix, with their debut full-length album, Arise, is the first ever black metal album ever. And the reason why I put it so low within this chart is that all the way at the top is a discussion between Venom or Bathory being the first ever black metal band. And that discussion has been going on for so long that the idea of it being someone else seems almost abysmal of a take. But again, what if I told you that Amoebix, a crust punk band from the UK, was actually the first ever black metal band. Here's how the argument works, is that Venom was never a black metal band. They were always like proto-black metal, not fully fleshed out. Yes, they take influence from Motorhead and becomes a little bit darker, but they're always looked at as a prototype, not a fully fleshed out black metal band. Where with Bathory around 1985, Quarthon released the uh, self-titled debut, which is more of like speed metal. It's not truly a black metal album yet, but he also released The Return, which came out in May of 1985, where with Ambiex, it was released, yes, in September of 1985, but it was produced in June of 1985, which meant they were writing the album a year or two previous from it. And this argument kind of conflicts the idea between Bathory or Ambiex truly writing out the first ever black metal album as the dates for it can be kind of misconstrued. And when you actually listen to this album Arise by Ambiex, it sounds black metal. It's raw, it's atmospheric, the lyrics are about occultism and war, that it has a lot of features that you would attach with black metal, and no one ever brings this up into the argument because, again, the idea between it being between Bathory or Venom is just so synonymous 
that including anyone else just seems so obsolete. But seriously, check this album out, Ambix Arise, and you're going to notice that around its time in 1985, it sounds like a lot of what first wave black metal would be accustomed to sounding like. Alright, that'll do it for this iceberg chart. Like always guys, make sure you guys drink plenty of water to stay hydrated, and have a great day.